Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody, welcome back to the It Could Be a Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And with us today is our friend and sister in Christ, Susan Heck. Susan, welcome back to the It Could Be a Grace podcast. Thank you, Dave. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's great to great to have you. Uh, can you uh, catch us up on your uh, what's happening in your life, ministry, and what ministry projects you're working on? Sure. Uh, Ministry-wise, Debbie and I are staying very busy. We've been going out quite a few times this year. I think we had 45 on the calendar. I had to cancel three due to um, deaths of people. But um, And then just so we're staying busy. We're, I think we have 44 on the calendar next year. So still just very involved in traveling every weekend, discipling, counseling during the week. So just staying very busy with that ministry. Uh, as far as um, my personal life, I think most people probably who know me know that my son passed away just four months ago, and uh, we were on a family vacation, all of us, my children, my, their spouses and grandchildren, seven grandchildren, and my son passed away on the second day of our vacation, unexpectedly, sudden, and so that was a challenge, still is a challenge, so um, that's new in my life. Um, so, uh, as far as, uh, what's going on otherwise, we've, uh, continued to publish books with 316 and, and staying busy with that too. And I just finished a second volume to On Our Knees. Uh, that's probably our top seller with the Master On Our Knees, which is a book on various prayers of the Bible. And I just fi- finished a second volume to that. And so they'll be publishing that. I don't know when, sometime in the near future, Lord willing. So that's kind of a quick catch up on, what's been going on in my life so yeah that's really good and and um you know the guys and gals at 316 publishing i met them recently uh last this last march at shepherd's conference and they're just doing really good work uh so i'm really super thankful that you are publishing they're publishing your work and uh so that's a really good thing um and i know we're going to talk about uh your losing your your son recently and also you know your um your your husband in the last few years and this is part of you know in the last six months or so we've been talking about suffering on the podcast so one of my friends good friends locally he he asked the question and it always kind of has resonated with me what is the lord teaching me through these times so this is kind of like the the heart behind this question what are what are some lessons that you know the lord has taught you about grief and suffering through these two losses that you've experienced several things actually i think first of all that we're not as strong as we think we are Sometimes even the strongest of God's saints, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, but um, I think through the taking home of my son to glory, um, that had shown me a part of myself I didn't know was there in the sense of questioning what the Lord was doing in my personal life. Um, didn't understand it, didn't didn't understand why he was taking him, why he took him, left me without my son and my daughter-in-law without her husband, the church without the pastor, my grandsons without their dad. So for the first few weeks, I really wrestled. And um, I finally came to grips and repented after reading and studying Hebrews 3 and the Israelites' hardened heart and their refusal to um, to trust God. They were in unbelief. And so he said, you won't enter into the promised land. You won't enter into my rest. So I was very convicted by that, and I repented and asked the Lord to forgive me, and I received that trial with open hands instead of a clenched fist, which I felt I did uh, do some the first three weeks. So I I was very thankful for that lesson that um, you better take heed to your walk, and um, so that was a warning to me. So I learned that, and then also contentment. I've I've been content. Feel like I've learned to be content as a widow and I was getting used to my new life then the Lord took my son and so I'm now learning to be content without my one of my children 
And so I would say that. And then as Spurgeon says, resting my head on the pillow of God's sovereignty, I that just always rings to me that God is sovereign. So I just rest my head on that pillow that God is sovereign. And he had Charles's days numbered before the foundation of the world. And so there's nothing we can do to uh, bring him back. And so we we have to rest in his his good providential care. So I would say those are probably the three main things, contentment, God's sovereignty, and how frail we can be in our faith if we're not careful. No wonder Jesus said to Peter, I pay, prayed for you that your faith will not fail. So, um, you know, I'm so thankful the Lord does pray for us and advocates for advocates for us. Mm, that's amen. Amen. And I, and I'm reminded, you know, you you uh, you graciously wrote an endorsement of one of my latest books, uh, "The Journey of a Lifetime." You know, and isn't that true? Contentment is a journey. It's mm -hmm. you know, and that and I was pretty intentional on in the subtitle there because there was other subtitles I could have used, but it's a journey, and mm -hmm. we're headed towards it. That doesn't mean that, like you're talking about, it doesn't mean that we've arrived, right? We we haven't right. figured it out, um, no. but we do have peace you know, with God and mm -hmm. we have the peace that's being made real in our, in our experience. And that, that's enough. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I remind, I'm reminded as you were talking, um, a few years ago, my dear mentor died of COVID pneumonia. And a couple of years before that, he had a, he had a stroke and he had to have a stint put in his heart. And when he died, unfortunately, it, his heart basically gave up and so did his brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was basically his body just basically totally mm -hmm. shut down and i had a really hard time with that because he was not only like a mentor he was like my adopted big brother mm -hmm. and I, I remember coming out of that realizing that even though i had all this theology and experience i i knew all these things boy these these kind of those kind of situations they they show you what you really know and what you don't and i didn't know how to deal right. with that and right. what ended up coming out of it is i needed to learn to rest mm -hmm. and as i rested more and it took some time just just sleeping mm -hmm. relaxing and not we're not talking about sabbath we're talking about like set aside time mm -hmm. where i was having to sleep and rest and re put a put aside things um and God was teaching me through that, that I needed to rest more in him. And so that was a, that was a, le that was a big thing that coming out of his kind of coming out of his death that helps me today. When you fast forward to this last mm -hmm. year, had I not learned that lesson a couple of years ago, I might not have made it through this year mm -hmm. when, when my mom's uh, second husband died of, his second massive widow, what well, they call it a widow maker, but it's basically a hundred percent blockage in the heart valve, main the heart main heart valve going to the heart. Mm -hmm. And so when when he died, I had to take over for my mom and her care and everything. And now we've got and now ten months later I've managed to get her life back together. And now mm -hmm. she's in down here in Oregon and I mean, I'm we're taking care of her not in her home, but in a she's in a actual memory care facility, mm -hmm. and and these kind of these kind of things like what you're talking about, what we're what I'm sharing about, they're very real, mm -hmm. they're real, very real pain. You mm -hmm. know, we all have we all have these things that are hurt, and the mm -hmm. but God is using those things like you were talking about like what's your attitude what's your disposition like i just said i had to realize a few months into the, a couple of years ago i can't deal with this i need help i need to sit with somebody and they need to help me realize what i need to learn and that's a that's a good thing mm -hmm. like um we, we have to take this posture what is the lord trying to teach me mm -hmm. through this because sometimes he he is trying to teach us sometimes that's for our benefit but sometimes that's for somebody else's benefit mm -hmm. and yeah. and uh if, but if we don't have the posture of trying to learn from that um we're never going to learn the lesson and we're never going to be useful and we're never going to be able to help other people and i think for you know, it's easy to get uh, bitter. I certainly have been there. 
who hasn't check please on you know aisle three you know um you know i've been i've been bitter i've been angry i've done all those things like you mentioned um in my christian life but uh it's we have to like you were talking about we have to reframe those things and remind ourselves of god mm -hmm. and his goodness and his grace so yeah, yeah. any thoughts on that no, I totally agree. I, I think so. And I think that we do have to stop and pause and, and, you know, take time to really think we're behind on our thinking time. We get so busy. And uh, so I think the Lord sometimes allows these sufferings and trials to make us stop and to reevaluate what's, what's really important in life. And so I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the pauses that he puts in my life, even though sometimes they're painful, <laughs> So, but they're good. <laughs> Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. So, Susan, how can the church do better at preparing the people of God to face suffering? I think by teaching on it, teaching on the doctrine of suffering, um, teaching the books of the Bible that deal with suffering, First Peter, James, Job, <laughs> uh, looking at the sufferings of our Lord, looking at the sufferings of those in the Old and New Testament, who went through suffering, Joseph, Stephen, just there's so many examples of, of the saints of old, the prophets who suffered, and who the apostles and the disciples. So I think giving us a good, healthy doctrine of suffering, helping us also by uh, taking us to people, the, the martyrs in the past, the even current people who are suffering now around the world. I think I read where there's 96,000 people that are persecuted every year for their faith. So uh, hearing their testimonies, people in our churches that are going through suffering, uh, whether it's persecution for their faith or whether it's suffering like me, trials through death of loved ones. So I think listening, giving them opportunity to share and to, like you're doing with me now, what are you learning and how can we better, you know, serve in this area where people are suffering? So um, just broadening our, our horizon and giving us some understanding of, of the doc, because we don't like to talk about it. We only want to hear about the good stuff and you know, the football and, you know, just whatever pleases the ear. But we, we need, and especially depending on what happens to our country, we better be learning about the doctrine of suffering and persecution um, because we are there now and it's probably going to get worse depending on what happens. I think it's going to get worse. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the church needs to prepare us by teaching us about it. I 100% agree with you. No matter who is elected in the coming uh, days here, we are recording guys on election day. No matter what happens, um, you know, God is sovereign and we know that he appoints the leaders that he has for us. And even those leaders can be a judgment like Amen. Calvin talked about. So, Amen. you know, we, we have to we have to get real. Like you were mentioning, you have james and first peter second peter i mean a, a significant portion of of course you have the prison epistles mm -hmm. um that that are written paul is in prison um the book of hebrews to a suffering church mm -hmm. uh that they might know the sufficiency of christ james like you mentioned uh jesus teaching as you were talking about you wrote a you just wrote on john's uh 16 mm -hmm. Um, the upper room discourse there. I mean, then you, then you go to the Old Testament and you, you start to look at Daniel and mm -hmm. Joseph and you look at, um, you know, the people of God in the Old Testament and on and on it goes, right? So, right. I mean, then you, then you fast forward and you just look at church history. Um, you look at, you look at, I think you mentioned Fox's Books of Martyrs is a good one to take a look at and, and realize that people have actually faced a significant amount of suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And pain. And uh, what do they, what do they do to prepare for that? You know, yeah. They, yeah. they got, they got in their Bible, they got mm -hmm. in prayer, they got with God's people. Um, they didn't right. have, they didn't have back then, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have social <laughs> media. Um, mm -hmm. They just had face to face interaction and, you know, until really the printing press mm -hmm. came along in the Reformation, they didn't have a lot of books either. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. You didn't have a whole stack of books to go and read about suffering. 
You know, yeah. so all you had was your Bible and you had your pastor to hear about that. For some of you, that's going to be shocking. You're going to be like, wow, I didn't have my favorite author and I didn't have my Bible and I didn't have my notebook. Wow. What, what, what would I do? Well, the most of the church for church history has, has dealt with that. So yeah. anyway, the Bible's the best. The but... Bible's the best. So yeah. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on that, sister? No, I agree. I agree totally. I mean, books are great, and I've read several through the sufferings of losing my husband and my child. But at the same time, the Word of God is my food and my sustenance, and those things are written for our learning and that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So I that's where my meat and my joy, my comfort comes from. So I totally agree with you, even though I'm thankful for people like Elizabeth Elliot, who've lost three husbands and, um, you know, just the different people that I know. I, one of the ladies who's mentored me for uh, 40 years now, she's lost two husbands. So she's 90, she was 92 yesterday. So she's been a blessing to me through widowhood. So those, those are good live examples, but the best thing is the scriptures, the Holy scriptures and the nearness of the spirit and our father. So uh, those are the best, <laughs> better than books. <laughs> and I know when we when we talk about examples today, you know, there's a lot of bad examples. There's even a lot of people who really struggle, of course, with experience. But, you know, the kind of experience and the kind of examples that we're talking about today are godly examples mm -hmm. and people that have actually walked through with the Bible. And that's a that's an important distinction just for people as they mm -hmm. come out and dealing with, you know, false doctrine, word of faith and other things today. They really struggle with this. And so they struggle with, hey, can I learn from experience? Can I even talk about my experience? And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a good thing, you know, as long as our as we're sharing our experience as in we're learning from God's word. Mm -hmm. We're always tethering it to God's word and what God mm -hmm. has said and what God means and then how I actually took those principles and learned mm -hmm. from it. And I think that's an important thing for people to um, to hear today because, like I said, you know, you have the influence of the word of faith and which just talks about my experience and other things today that um, that that can give the impression, right, we could say that people – people don't want to share their experience and they don't think it matters. Right. So what do you, what do you think? No, I, I do think if our experience is grew, grounded and rooted in the truth of God's word, and I think it's very imperative to share those things. And uh, even now in my own church, I've been widowed three years and we just recently had two women that lost their husbands. And so they said, you've gone before us to set the, the example of how to go through this. So, um, I think it is imperative that we have one another to help one another during these times. Um, le real live examples. Yes, we have the scriptures, but to have real live examples so we can comfort others with the comfort we've been comforted with. So, yeah, I agree. And, and you know, we, we were talking previously, uh, privately, before we recorded about emotions, right? And even this, this can draw, I think, into this idea as well as I know that many people, Christians in our audience, they know that they know the good theology of suffering, but they struggle with taking that theology then and applying it into the to the to the discouragement pain anxiety discouragement mm -hmm. and it's understandable all of us at all of us need help in growing mm -hmm. in in the those those areas ever ever i don't care how long you've been a christian i don't care how much mm -hmm. time you've been a biblical counselor or mm -hmm. you know education wise um but um any 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 thoughts on that um on taking the the the, the good teaching of scripture and then applying it to those, to those specific hurts and struggles that we have. Yeah. I think that, you know, for me personally, just having been a student of scripture for a long time, studying and writing books for women and memorization of scripture, those things flood my mind. And I don't know how people go through these challenging times without some kind of understanding of uh, not only the Bible, but theology. And um, so I, you know, I think it behooves us as Christians, we must be in the word day and night. 
um, so that we we don't go astray during times like this, and we understand the the bigger picture of what God is doing, as in Job's life. You know, the latter end was better than the beginning, <laughs> and so um, we have to bank on what God says is true and His promises. So I I think the the word of God is imperative during times of suffering. Um, I don't know where I would be without it. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll share another personal story. Um, in, in June, we thought my dad's uh, frontal temporal dementia was going to go towards the end. And he, he's probably closing in on the end. But I quickly realized probably this is going to be the last, one of the last times where I have a substantive sharing with him of mm. what he means to me, what he has meant to me. And this is for uh, this time my benefit, you know. Mm. And... Um, that was honestly, Susan, that was one of the hardest things. This was this mm -hmm. past June. That was one of the, probably the hardest things that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I had people praying for me. I had people asking me, how did that go? You know, and it just, it meant, it meant a lot, um, mm -hmm. because it's been a, with my dad, it's been a 12 year so far struggle with his disease. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, it's not, it, it gets a little overwhelming to post about it, you know, asking people to pray. And then the, the amount of response and the outpouring is, is, is amazing and it's humbling, but it's also kind of like, ah, I feel choked, you know, like, ah, I don't want to talk about this all the time. So I don't want to, you know, talk about it all the time. And, um, what, what I've come to realize now is where, where he's at is, this is this time seeing him calling him talking about him or whatever um mm -hmm. is for my benefit because at this time he doesn't even can't even process it right mm -hmm. and and so what i have to i've had to learn um is to like you're talking about manage manage my emotions taking mm -hmm. that truth reminding myself of those promises and it's and it's at this point where I'm at with that, it, it, some people ask me, they're like, how can you be at total peace with that? It's taken me, it took five years, maybe mm. six, seven years to get to where I was. And it also took realizing what I can and I can't do, which took another probably a couple years, mm. <laughs> you know, mm. and, and just realizing I can't do everything for him. I can't be everything for him, even though I want to be. And even though I can do a whole lot to help him um and then and then the phone calling and caring for him is more for my benefit than for his at this point mm -hmm. and that's true that 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 what i'm saying is that can be applied to our caring for other people with really difficult mm -hmm. situations and i've had to learn that and it's and it's not a it's not a fun thing to learn mm -hmm. you know because you know who doesn't want to be there for their family member and yeah, the in sure. their pain and their suffering and i'm not saying that you shouldn't be there but mm -hmm. i'm saying that you should think about it how much mm -hmm. can you actually handle of it because right. it's hard you know a debilitating disease like dementia and mm -hmm. those things or cancer they're they're just really mm -hmm. hard yeah, and you are. have to realize what what can i handle and it's okay if you can only handle so much if you can handle going to visit one one day a week you should have zero guilt you know, you should have, and and you should have zero regret. You need to make peace with what you can do and be okay with that. And it takes a lot of, it, it takes a lot of time. It took me a lot of time. It, mm -hmm. it takes people a different amount of time, and and that's that's okay. But mm -hmm. you know, that was part of my. You mentioned some of your journey of contentment. That's been part of my journey of of contentment, and even writing that book on contentment was itself a journey. Um, for sure, um, a sanctifying, a very, very sanctifying journey. But mm. at the same time, um, this was uh, something that, that um, I've, I've had to learn and something that I think can help other people as they're, you know, facing suffering. And like you said, we're going to face a tremendous, potentially, and even great, depending on who's elected here, we're going to face an even a, a greater amount, especially if a certain um, political candidate gets elected. We all know who that certain person is, so I don't need to say who that is. 
but we could potentially be facing a significant mm -hmm. amount of suffering, uh, right. physical suffering even. And yeah. so um, we we need to we need to in America we need to get off our you know duff if you will. And I said duff on a podcast, Susan, um, <laughs> and get in our Bibles and That's right. get in our Word and Amen. and eat it and um, you know treasure it and mm -hmm. so. And yeah, I have lots true. of thoughts on that. No, I totally agree. I, I think it's, I mean, we've said it, but I guess you can say it again. It's imperative, you know, it's good for us to be afflicted. At least we go astray and, and, you know, you just bank on those, the promises of God, which are true. Yes. And amen. And the peace that surpasses all understanding and the confidence that we have when we're weak, he's strong. But these are things that, you know, if you're not in the scriptures, you're not going to, you're not going to fall back on that. You're going to fall back on false saviors. You're going to go to things and refugees that are not going to be satisfying. And they might bring a momentary pleasure or relief from the pain, but ultimately you have to trust in the Lord and his word and his promises to be able to get through these times of suffering. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So the follow-up question of this is, how can the church do better at walking alongside the people of God while they're facing suffering? I think making sure that uh, the needs are being met, whatever they are. It might be for companionship, for food, for um, activities together with families. Um, maybe they're, you know, they need something done around the house. As for me, I'm a widow, so living alone. So just looking to see, do you need anything? Do you need something fixed? Do you need a... Uh, light bulb change and you know you need someone to get on the ladder and get you know just things like that I think just practical uh, checking in on them um, I, I had a friend that did every day after Doug died for a full year every night she texts me or right, how are you how can I pray for you tonight how was your day and I know it wasn't rote I knew she was genuine and sincere and I've thanked her often for that that meant a lot to me that first year in after Doug passed so um and I just think we forget. We we forget. Um, you know, the first two or three months you're in a you're in a state of shock. And then after that, the reality hits in. This person is not coming back, and you're gonna have your Christmas without them, their birthday, their this, their that. And it's it's really difficult and challenging. So I think remembering that it's not necessarily right then when the person dies, it's later that that's when you really need to come in and put your spiritual arms around them and see what you can do and, and mean it, not just have it be rote, but really mean it. Like, what can I do for you? And then I think the person that's grieving like me, I need to get out of my shell and look out for others who are also hurting. So when I start feeling sorry for myself, I think, who can I minister to? What widow do I know that needs a phone call or a visit or have her over for dinner or have her come over and play games? or uh, So I need to get out of myself, too. I don't want to become self-focused. So, But I do think we could do better and with ministering. I just noticed after me, there was two other women who lost their husbands. And I just noticed that progression right away. We start praying for them. But then as the weeks go on, they're kind of left off the prayer list. And I was like, you guys have no idea. This is when they need the most prayers is that third or fourth month. So <clears throat> that's what I have found in both of my cases of losing my husband and my son. Yeah, that's really good. Really good. And it, and it just touches on the whole purpose of, of these things, right? Um, mm -hmm. We're to be intentional and we're to be purposeful. Mm -hmm. And, and that means if you're seeing somebody sitting by themselves at church, Yep. go up to them and say hey would you like to sit with us or do you mm -hmm. have somebody or, or or do you just want to be alone there's mm -hmm. nothing weird or awkward about that by the way mm -hmm. it just is sharing sharing with that person that you care about them and you right. can even say hey I'm, I'm saying this because i care about you and yeah. i know I, we don't know each other but i noticed that you sit alone and we don't want you to sit alone we want you to be cared for as well and um you know the same in our small group you know if you see somebody that comes alone mm -hmm. hey would you like to come to thanksgiving or christmas mm -hmm. or um mm -hmm. would you like to come out to to lunch with us or dinner mm -hmm. with us would you like to come over to our house and you know just just be just start thinking through hey i can help this person i can be there for mm -hmm. them 
and and how can I do that? Well, I can open yeah. my home. I can I can help take you out to lunch or a meal or you know and and just start just start thinking that way um and start coming even at, back up here just a minute start coming to church thinking hey there's probably a hurting person or a struggling person or something in your church uh or how are you gonna are you gonna minister to that person are you gonna walk by them mm -hmm. and uh you don't have to have a theology degree to help the hurting person mm -hmm. you just have to have a listening mm -hmm. ear and a willing heart and a mm -hmm. servant's heart um, and, and guess what? It's okay for you to pull in your pastor into that conversation, um, as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah. and to say, Hey, I, Hey, I don't know how to help you here, but I know this pastor or, or this person does, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, th there's nothing wrong with that either. No. So, no. you know, um, any, any thoughts on that, Susan? No, I think that's good. And if you can't yourself meet the need, Uh, then maybe have somebody, you know, else do that. And so like I travel most weekends and so, you know, Hey, I can't, I see this brother or sister has a need, but I can't do it. So, which, you know, could you find someone that can, or uh, let the pastor know to maybe find somebody that could help when you can't, but no, I think we need to, we need to be even at church on Sunday, we need to be looking out around the audience and who, who is sitting alone or who's just gone through a really tremendous trial that week and what kind of word of encouragement can we give to them um, to even a pat on the back or a hug or, you know, just whatever, something that shows that we care. Uh, those things mean a lot. They do. They really do. And, you know, there's, there's always three people that I'm looking for in any kind of ministry that I've ever had. It's, it's who's hurting and who's struggling and who really needs an arm around the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's me <laughs> and am I, am I coming, <laughs> am I, am I coming even the question to ask, am I coming? And if I'm hurting, am I going to be honest with somebody about the fact that I need prayer mm -hmm. and I need a listening ear and I need help, you know, yeah. even before you start thinking about ministering to somebody, are you going to come uh, uh, to church hungry and needy? Mm -hmm. and realizing that you might have a hurt or a pain and you need prayer. And are you going to ask your pastor or a small right. group leader or somebody for, for prayer too? I mean, right. we got to, I, I remember something Burke Parsons tweeted a long time ago that we should come to church, um, you know, with our mask off, mm -hmm. you know, cause some of us come with this mask and all, mm -hmm. so all is well and everything's okay. And we forget mm -hmm. that we're, we're coming To the house of God because we're in need of God's grace and so Amen. we're to come hungry for his word hungry for his grace and that's what God is supplying through the preached word and through the fellowship of his people right mm -hmm. to strengthen us to build us up to encourage us and yeah so how uh, we should never come I don't want to say how dare we I almost said how dare we but I don't want to I don't want to say that we we shouldn't come I mean with this idea of a mask um, mm -hmm. we should rip off that mask We should ask God to t take that mask away and just to come mm -hmm. uh, ready to believe, to receive his, his word, to preach rightly handled, of course, and to be discerning, but, but, but to, to grow and mm -hmm. to fellowship. And so, yeah, I agree. yeah. Well, Susan, uh, where can people uh, find out more about your ministry? You know, like they can find out more about your books, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all yeah. that. Uh, with the master.org we'll have everything facebook take them directly to facebook instagram resources uh, my youtube channel uh, shepherd's wives conference all the facets of with the master ministries which is growing uh, they can sign up for the newsletter they can see my speaking schedule they can all that so it's all right there in one fine package called with the master.org <laughs> wonderful so, yeah Wonderful. Glad to hear the Lord, how the Lord is at work there. That's, that's definitely a, a praise. So how, as we just wrap up today, can you give us a few takeaways, Susan? Um, yes, I would say that when I think about my life in the last few years, I just realized that life is very short and eternity is very long. And so that we need to live for the kingdom and don't waste our life. Um, redeem the time, make every moment count. Walk in love and humility and love God and love others and and um, do the next thing and just be content. You know, 
wherever you're at, just uh, make the most of that opportunity because it could be your last. I mean, the day before my son passed away, um, he said, hey, mom, let's take a picture together. I had no idea that would be my last picture with my son. And the next morning he was found unresponsive. So um, you, we don't know these things. So um, we just need to make the most of each opportunity. We just, we have no idea. Live for the kingdom, live for Christ. When it's all been said and done, that's the only thing that matters. Have I done my best? Yep. Have I done, live for him. So that's what I would say. <laughs> That is, that is so good, and it, and it it reminds me of something my my wife who has lost both of her parents due to cancer and um, mm -hmm. you know another tragic situation that's a lot more to get into. But she she's like when in the early days of my dad, she would say how you need to spend time with your dad because there wasn't anything that I wouldn't do to to be able to call my parents and to you know love them. And it was just a reminder, a convicting reminder at times, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. but, a, but a gracious encouragement from a godly wife yes, to, to give that, give my dad a call, to give my mom a call yeah. because you don't know, and you don't yeah, you know, don't. you don't know, um, when you go to bed, Hey, say, say to your spouse, I love you. I care about you. I'm thankful for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when we first got married, um, a family member wrote a letter and, said to me dave find your find sarah around the house and just give her a hug right. tell her what she means to you and it's exactly the same thing that you're saying you know right. you're never going to regret those 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 words and say those don't wait till you're and at the hospital bed to say those things say those things that mean the most again and again and again just to your point so and i know after my husband passed my son He's always been a good son, but he every I don't think he ever hung up the phone where he said, Mom, I love you. So I just uh, think the reality of his father passing, who he missed dearly, he just realized you just don't know. You just don't know. So anyway, the Lord is good. He is. He is. Um, so guys, uh, I just want to encourage you to check out Susan, her website, her ministry. If she is in your area, I want to encourage you to go in to that event um, and be blessed, ladies, by Susan's ministry, by her books, and uh, just encourage you guys to continue to check out what uh, the, how the Lord is at work through and in, in and through Susan's ministry. And, uh, she's a very trusted, uh, women's Bible teacher. So, uh, thank you so much, Susan, for joining me. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.